I am Yolanda Cooper, and I have the honor of serving as the Dean and University Librarian for Emory University. And my job right now is to welcome you to this event and this reading from our distinguished colleague. I do, before we get started, want to thank everybody who pulled this program together, uh, CCR uh, events team, Maya Cody. Uh, and I also want to thank the Carlos Museum for this beautiful space. I love this. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> So as you may know, the libraries host a number of events and exhibits throughout the year. And if you would like to be on our mailing list to get that list of the things that we're doing, please look for somebody with one of these on and ask them to add you. And we'll make sure you get advertisements for everything we do. Coming soon is our signature program for the Rose Library and main fundraiser, the Twelfth Night Revel. Uh, that happens in uh, February on the 21st. Um, our special guest poet for that evening is Nikki Giovanni. So you may want to come for that one. Um, at the Rebel, if you've never been there before, there's a number of poetry readings through the night. And then at the end, the guest poet uh, does a reading for us. Uh, she will also do a reading on Saturday, Saturday the 22nd at 4 o'clock at the Schwartz Center. So it'll be a weekend of poetry, so keep that on your calendars. Now, um, let's move on to the heart of the program. I do want to note that after Kevin's reading, uh, Jennifer King will come up and close the program, and I believe there will be a book signing afterwards, so keep that in mind. It is my honor and pleasure to introduce our special guest, Kevin Young. Kevin is currently the director of the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture in New York City and the poetry editor for The New Yorker. But prior to that, he was here at Emory for 11 years as the Charles Howard Candler Professor of Creative Writing and English. He was also the curator in his spare time, I don't know how he did all that, <laughs> curator of the Rose Library Literary Collections and the Raymond Donowski Poetry Library. Through his diligent curatorial work and his passion for the written word, the Rose Library has amazing collections that might never have been acquired if it wasn't for Kevin's keen eye, his relationships, and his knowledge and literature, uh, knowledge of literature and poetry. Kevin is the author of 13 books of poetry and prose and the editor of nine others with a 10th coming out next year, the Library of America, African American Poetry, and Anthology. His most recent book of poetry, Brown, which he'll read from tonight, and his nonfiction book, Bunk, The Rise of Hoaxes, Humbug, Plagiarists, Phonies, Post Facts, and Fake News, <laughs> were both named New York Times Notable Books and long listed for the National Book Award. Bunk was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award and named Best Book of 2017 by NPR, The Los Angeles Times, and The Atlantic. His previous nonfiction book, The Gray Album, On the Blackness of Blackness, won the Gray Wolf Press Nonfiction Prize and the Penn Open Book Award. It was also New York Times Notable Book for 2012 and a finalist for the 2013 National Book Critics Circle Award. Kevin was inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2016, and he is Emory University Distinguished Professor, and was recently, and probably still is to the end of the fall, the Bain Swigget Visiting Fellow at Princeton. So join me in welcoming our colleague and friend, Kevin Young. How's everyone? Good. Good. Thank you so much, Yolanda. Um, and uh, what a pleasure to see so many people here and so many familiar faces. Uh, and indeed, it's a pleasure and honor and a little bit daunting to be back. Um, but it's nice to be among friends. Um, I want to thank a number of people. 
um, more places. Uh, I want to thank, of course, the Rose Library and Creative Writing, where I spent so much of time over the past, gosh, since 2005. And um, the Dean's Office and the President's Office, who made the visiting professorship possible, it really has meant a lot to continue this relationship with Emory uh, and with Atlanta, which is as beautiful as ever. I thought I'd read some uh, older poems before reading newer poems and uh, see where we go. So I wanted to start with a few odes. Um, these are poems that uh, think about what I usually call my Grecian urns, you know, uh, my nightingales, like uh, chicken and collard greens. Um, <laughs> But this is an ode to sweet potato pie. I just had some of my mama's this past Thanksgiving, so it's f fresh in my memory and mouth even. So this is ode to sweet potato pie. Caramel, coffee cake, chocolate I don't much love anyway, tough taffy, anything with nuts or raisins, Goobers, even my Aunt Dixie's apple pie recipe, or the sweet potato pie my mother makes sing, even heaven, even Boston cream pie, key lime, baked Alaska, dense flourless tort covered in raspberries like a Bronx cheer, sherbet, spelt right, <laughs> and sandwiches made of ice cream, even mint or coffee I never drink even sherry, and smooth port pulled up from shipwrecks preserved on the bottom of the sea. All this and more I would give up to have you here, pumpkin-colored father, cooking for me, your hungry oven humming just one more minute. This is an ode to gumbo, which I also had this past weekend. Um, uh, it's nice to be somewhere I don't have to explain what gumbo is, um, so I don't think I will. Um, yeah, ode to gumbo. I should say both my parents are from Louisiana. For weeks, I have waited for a day without death or doubt. Instead, the sky set a fire or the flood filling my face. A stubborn drain nothing can fix. Every day, death. Every morning, death. And every night, an evening. And each hour, a kind of winter. All weather is unkind. Too hot or cold that creeps the bones. Father, your face is a faith I can no longer see. Across the street, a dying yet still standing tree. So why not make a soup of what's left? Why not boil and chop something outside the mind? Let us welcome winter for a few hours, even in summer. Some say gumbo starts with filet or with roux, begins with oil and flour, making sure not to burn. I know gumbo starts with sorrow, with hands that cannot wait but must, with okra and a slow boil and things that cannot be taught, like grace done right Gumbo lasts for days. Done right, it will feed and feed you and not let go. Like grief, you can eat and eat and still plenty left. Food of the saints, gumbo will outlast even us. Like pity, you will curse it and still hope for the wing of chicken bobbed up from below. Like God, gumbo is hard to get right. And I don't bother asking for it outside my mother's house. Like life, there's no one way to do it and a hundred ways from here to Sunday to get it dead wrong. 
save all the songs. I know none, even this, that will bring a father back to his son. Blood is thicker than water under any bridge and gumbo thicker than that. It was my father's mother who taught mine how to stir its dark mirror. Now it is me who wishes to plumb its secret depths. Black angel, Madonna of the shadows, Hail Mary strong and dark as dirt. Gumbo's scent fills this house like silence and tells me everything has an afterlife. Given enough time and the right touch, you need okra, sausage, bones of a bird, an entire onion cut open and wept over, stirring cayenne in till the end burns the throat, till we can amen and pretend such fiery mercy is all we know. I uh, wasn't going to read this one, but it seems like I should. Um, these are all from a book called Dear Darkness. came out in 2008, but they're also in a book called Blue Laws. Um, and this is Ode to Boudin, uh, the wonderful sausage. It's sort of like fast food in Louisiana, in southern Louisiana. Every little uh, gas station or corner store has their own boudin that they make fresh, which is just amazing. And you argue over whose is better, of course. you know. Um, and uh, so this is Ode to Boudin. You are the chewing gum of God. <laughs> you are the reason I know that skin is only that, holds more than it meets. The heart of you is something I don't quite get, but don't want to. Even a fool like me can see your broken beauty, the way out in this world where most things disappear, driven into ground. You are ground already. And like rice, you rise. Drunken deacon, sausages half-brother, jambalaya's baby mama. <laughs> you bring me back to the beginning, to where things live again. Homemade savior, you fed me the day my father sat under flowers, white as the gloves of pallbearers tossed on his beer. Soon, hands will lower him into ground richer than even you. For now, root of all remembrance, your thick chain sets me spinning, thinking of how, like the small, perfect, possible soul, you spill out like music, my daddy dead, or grief, or both. Afterward, his sisters, my aunts, dancing in the yard to a car radio tuned to Zydeco beneath the pecan trees. So um, switching gears a little bit, um, I wrote a book called Brown. And um, a lot of it I wrote here. Uh, and I started thinking a lot about my own childhood um, and thinking about growing up in Kansas, which is in part where I grew up. Um, and I started remembering all the terrible coaches and. Uh, people I had, <laughs> so I wrote about it. <laughs> this is called Practice. It's from a, a sequence called Phys Ed. It's what they used to call gym when I was a kid. Now they just don't have gym for kids. <laughs> it's a great idea. <laughs> uh, it's called Practice. Each afternoon for hours, our bodies weren't our own. We'd have to run, give coach 20, then ready, wrestle. Nabus, nicknamed Tonka, because he was squat and tough as those toy trucks, could climb the gym's ropes 30 feet using only his hands. Once, I watched him about to be pinned, then stand up with a kid across his hairless chest and slam him for the win. With some whale splayed on our stomachs, we'd practice bridges arcing on our heads for hours, hoping to build necks and break choke holds like backs. I still have the letter jacket 
won mostly by making 98 weight all fall easy. Still, I drink only spit for days, swallowing insults about my family and skin, the way teammates would call you spook, then beg you for food before a meet. On buses, boys practice becoming adults, lying about girls, playing rock, paper, scissors for pain, then rubbing the ears of enemies till they bloomed into cauliflowers. Whenever anyone asked to share, I'd hawk into my sandwiches, put the halves back together, then swallow them slow. So in Kansas, I played a lot of Little League. Um, and uh, in Kansas, I ended up playing on an all-black baseball team. And so this is a poem about that. It's from another sequence called Mercy Rule. You may remember the Mercy Rule. If you like were down 10 points by the fifth inning, they like called the game. Um, 10 runs, I should say. So uh, it refers to that in the poem. The division. We played in blue jeans. Unlike other teams, in their tidy PAL uniforms, the cops paid for. We were outlaws, our hats dark, maroon shirts with our names on the back, skin black and brown and in between. We played a mean game, if only after a season of being the bad news bears, losing, umps even invoking the mercy rule some games. We'd wake and pray for rain, or an ankle sprain. One day something gave way, the spokes they turned, and all of a sudden we won, beating teams twice our size who'd skunked us before, giving goose eggs to kids in golden sleeves and tall corn yellow socks, their new cleats aimed at our shins. We were our own Negro League. Our mascot was Reggie, chubby, goofy, Marcel the relief and Damien our best pitcher, his long nails stabbing the stitches, his wind up quick, change clipping the corner of the dish. I even saved one game, bases loaded, the bullpen spent or gone wild, the backup pitchers back up, I threw slow but straight, the final strike turtling across the plate. The team hoisted me high that night. Our fathers, for once, smiling wide. Our final game, we took first place and won the division. The sore faces the losing team wore less shock or disbelief. That you could take than disgrace and plain rage. The mask of their catcher tossed into the Kansas dust. Anger sat there, uneasy and too easy. Even their parents hated us, claimed to have forgotten our trophies. Who cared if they couldn't take watching us celebrate that for the required final handshake, good game, good game, good game. They christened their palms with spit. Later, we'd wash up clean and sprinkles or chocolate dip hid our ice cream, vanishing. You didn't know the uh, death poems were the funny ones, so. <laughs> Hope you got your laughs in then. I'm just kidding. Um, this poem is called I Doubt It, um, which is a code name for something, which you'll hear in the poem. But um, it's about my son, really, and his first sleepover. Some of you know my fine son. And he um, is doing well. And, but in this poem, I, you know, it's that horrible thing where they walk, he literally just walked down the street a few, uh, houses, but I was like, oh my God. Um, and walking into his room and like being sort of bereft, uh, which is how the poem opens. But I also realized later that there was this background and the poem almost kind of circles it. And I later write in Brown about the moment I was writing, which was the moment of Black Lives Matter and kids my son's age being killed for playing. And so there's a kind of loss that circles this poem that I uh, hope is bigger than just you know, that feeling of, of missing him. I doubt it. 
It's as if you have died when I head into your room. Only it's aging bears tucked in at night. Everything just as you left it, but quiet to switch off the lone night light. But you are just down the street at our neighbor boy's sleepover, turning nine tonight, where surely you barely sleep. I bet you're up drinking apple juice. <laughs> the way we once down soda or pop or root beer, RC or Atari by the leader, playing war and bullshit. What we codenamed, I doubt it. Though we boys were full of confidence. Sleeping bags, a war zone where nobody died or got sent home. Where we'd play fight and camp out and need no light to keep us company till dawn. This is how we learnt about tomorrow. When I will wander over and tug you back where you also belong. By the hand, somewhat awake, sleeping bag under your arm, empty as a chrysalis. So I ended up writing a lot of music poems, uh, or should I say, I just keep writing them. And um, I thought I'd read one. Maybe I'll read a few. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so I'll, I think I'll read from the sequence, which I sometimes read from. It's a sonnet sequence, uh, which is to say it's a series of little songs. Um, and it's really about uh, sort of growing up with hip hop, which is about the same age I am. Um, it's not young anymore. Um, and uh, <laughs> at the same time, it's about sort of missing those times and, you know, back when music was good in the 90s. Um, <laughs> I just like to start trouble sometimes. <laughs> and so, um, you know, the poems interlink. It's uh, what's called a crown, but I'll just read through them. And uh, you'll, the titles are all song titles, pretty much. And it's called De La Soul is Dead. A roller skating jam named Saturdays. We were black then, not yet African American, so we danced every chance we could get. Thursdays and Saturdays we chant, the roof, the roof, the roof is on fire, we don't need no water, and folks' perms began to turn. <laughs> we had begun to dread or wear locks anyway, our temples we'd fade. We said, word, and Deaf said, dang, and down, and fly. We gave no goodbyes, just all right then, or <laughs> bet. No one was dead yet. People who died, Jim Carroll band. No one was dead yet, not that some didn't try. Often, friends of mine, these are people who died Died, weekends drank too much, then broke into the pool and swam, though I was barely good at that. The bottom I never did touch. Home almost dried, we listened for the dawn, or to Mr. Dobelina, Mr. Bob Dobelina. Glory, hella stupid, doused in eyeliner or lycra, and that was just the boys. Our favorite song was noise. The scenario. The two of us black met one night, dancing alongside each other to tribe at a party in the world's smallest room. Someone from Carolina brought moonshine, and over the beat, the clanking heat, Philippe leaned over his date to say, hey man, we should be friends. What you know, yo. And that was that. Popping the caps off brown red striped bottles with his teeth, he'd drink out the side of his mouth, sly. We heads kept ours dreaded, crowned. A decade later, he was gone. The scenario, our favorite of 500 songs. When you were mine. Nothing passed us by. Baby, you're much too fast. In 1990, we had us an early 80s party. 
Nostalgic already. I dug out my best OPs in two polos, fluorescent, worn simultaneously, collar up, pretend preppy. When Blondie came on, rapture, be pure. Things really got going, and then the dancing got shut down by some square. What was sleep even for? Housequake. What was sleep even for? The year before, a freshman, I threw a prince party, re-screwed the lights red and blue, the room all purple, people dancing everywhere, clicked play on the cassette till we slow sweated to Erotic City or Do Me Baby. I'm going down to Alphabet Street. Did anyone sleep alone that night? I feel for you. Shut up already. Damn. Cabbage Patch, Reverse Running Man, get some life wherever you can. Potholes in my lawn. This life. I confess we did look somewhat alike, Kenny and I. Baby dreads, tortoise shells, tight fade, though that night his giant white roommate, drunk on eight ball in the pool room, called out Kenny, Kenny, even when I said, I'm not him, and he began cursing me out. Quit pretending. That was too much. <coughs> Doppelgangers, unblood brothers. We should have done more with it. Dressed as the other for Halloween, chanced an evil twin movie. No dice. Instead, we danced side by side. Three is the magic number. Twins to the rhythm, we danced, as one does, to the remix of three is the magic number at a house party someone threw just because. We were black then, about to be African American, so folks schoolhouse rocked and smurfed whenever we damn well pleased. We should have done more, or believed, mon frere, mine own body double, given the campus cops the slip whenever they quizzed or frisked us for studying while black. Kenny, I hope you're somewhere far from here dancing away trouble. Little Wing. Save us. So late and still, our sophomore roommate has decided to pull out his guitar, plug in and play Little Wing, just the first bars, over and over. <laughs> Take anything you want from me till we only want him to finish to get for once to the end. <laughs> Years later, he'll kill himself. I still don't know how, much less fathom why. Carry Montserrat, last name a mountain. Play for us again. The last day of our acquaintance. How late it would get. Every party was an after party. Some nights we'd even let ourselves forget that dawn would come. I do not want what I haven't got. Mostly it did. Sometimes the morn was met less alone, her beauty and scent. Her buzzed head numbing your arm. Once you start, how can you quit all this remembering? We make love like memories, if lucky, and not too late. Making waves, I was just plugging in a boombox when the counselor came and screamed, Kevin, get these people out of here. Later, the pool, which is where this happened, sprung an unlikely leak, got closed for good and ill and us. Later, still, I'd climb down with Seamus, no shallows, to watch a different play with my roommate far more nude confessing in act two, a swim in a giant suit than the first when he was mad Sweeney cursed naked and muddy in a tree. Nice allegory, offered Heaney. Far was fate, it felt. How could we know how late? The choice is yours. Too late. The silence, ours, now sounds like the second when the music stops, not for good, but for a breath or two. Engine, engine, number nine on the New York transit line. If my train jumps off the track, and now we're back up. Oh, how high we jump. Reaching for the sky, hurricane purple, and a night mostly black, dark blue, red. 
Nobody, nobody was dead yet. Y'all doing all right? Um, I'm going to read some new poems and end with those. Um, before I do, I'll, I'll read this one uh, last poem from Brown, which is kind of a fable of sorts. Um, a fable and a memory and you know, a poem. Hive. The honeybee's exile is almost complete. You can carry them from hive to hive, the child thought, and that is what he tried, walking with them thronging between his pressed palms. Let him be right. Let the gods look away, as always. Let this boy, who carries the entire actual worrying world in his calm, unwashed hands, barely walking, bear us all there, buzzing, unstung. So, um, I've been reading, uh, or writing, I should say, new poems, and uh, you seem nice, so I thought I'd read some. <laughs> They're from a book that uh, I hope will be out soon. I'm not sure when, but um, yeah. They uh, kind of chart a journey. Um, many books do, but this one's specifically a journey to Louisiana. Um, where, like I said, both my parents are from, and really into the past, and, and you know, there's two uh, graveyards there that are just filled with my kin, um, and making that kind of pilgrimage uh, once a year, but this is really the specific time when uh, my son was quite young. And this first poem I'll read is called Halter. I'll mostly just read through them. Uh, and thank you again for coming. Halter. Nothing can make, make me want to stay in this world. Not the grass with its head of hair turning gray. Not the sway back horse in the field I swear I almost saw start to saunter. Nor the bent shadows late in the day drawing close. The neighbor's boat not yet docked, gathering snow. Not the dream with the moose hunched in its crown, shedding velvet, led by a silver halter through the shaded campground, a shawl over its shoulders like a caftan on a grandmother or her rocker whenever she's no longer there. Not the brass nail heads on the Adirondack chair I put together, sweating this morning that creaks but still does hold nor the cries of the others above water, beloved bright voices of summer echoing like the ice cream man in his whirring truck. Along the curb, his lights flash like an ambulance, playing the tune you cannot name yet know, except this babbling like a light barely shining from below the baby's cracked door. Egrets. Some say beauty may be the egret in the field who follows after the cows, sensing slaughter. But I believe the soul is neither air nor water, not this winged thing, nor the cattle who moans to make themselves known. Instead, the horses standing almost 15 hands high. Like regret, they come most of the time when called. Hungry, the grays eat from your palm tender toothed. Their surprising plum dark pl tongues flashing quick and rough as a match. Striking your hand, your arm startled into flame. It's called oblivion. In the field, the cows consider oblivion mulling it over. They and their many stomachs know nothing stays lost forever. 
that grass almost cruel resurrects again, again. They know even drought will end, though the family they belong to forgets. Cows know the slow closing eye of the pond will once more open and the sky. Rain will find their bowed backs, the burnt earth's offering. Cows keep no cry, only a slave's low moan. This slight rise they must climb. Sting. Burying weather. The stark heat we sweat in saying our goodbyes. Flowers bend in it, embarrassed almost. The agony of growing, the great effort trying not to die. This eulogy, the daisies right by sunlight, in storm, in the fall of what greets us all. Hurt is not meant by the blades of summer. The bumblebee somehow swims around, then away. For now, the sting of being. Tomorrow already a memory, a bite, bright and burning. This poem's called Dog Tags. We know what dog tags are? Yeah. Wear them around your neck. Dog tags. Of us, there is always less. The day's hammer passed, artificial daisies at the grave. Words I didn't choose from my father's headstone and those that came instead to live around my neck. Dog tags a tin pendulum on my chest. On my mother's side, my cousin, too young, dirt, a pile above her, but no stone. Nothing but the tin full name from the funeral home. The fresh plastic flowers that still wilt in this heat. At Blackjack, she lost everything my great aunt and uncle had saved. Even their low ranch where I first knew blue glass. Plastic covering the rug and the good couch in the sitting room. No one dared sit. The prickly underside of the clear runner, a cactus you couldn't help but touch. Uncle Wilmer's pickup long paid off, now stares empty under somebody else's tree. The liars and book cookers came with their knives, offering her seconds, and she sat and ate. Once you've tasted the stone-filled fruit of the underworld, you may never return. They took everything from her, my mother says, both of us shaking our heads, disbelieving how exacting death is, how deep the shade, except breath. She was in debt and dead within a year, went through money like water, and that didn't last long either. As we're talking cousins, I'll read this poem called Joy. Once we bathed in joy, ivory once, Mr. Bubbles, if lucky, sometimes accidentally our own pee. Mostly us little ones got soaked and scrubbed like dishes, teeth chipped like our tub. We filled it up. This was back when dirt and each other was all we loved my cousins and I, how we hated getting clean. It wasn't so much the water or the cold after as it was all that change, the gray circling the drain. Evenings, we bathed in palm olive green. Other nights, dawn. Thanks. Some of you had the same. <laughs> yeah. Oh, 
The fun and scary thing about a new book is you don't know where anything is. I'll just read um, two more, I think. Then we'll have some questions. This is called Bouquet. I hate when people do this, but do you mind if I read three more? Is that all right? <laughs> I hate it when people do that. Uh, well, I do that. They're short. Well, two of them. Bouquet. Tell the sky. Quit stealing you away. Above, storm clouds only threaten and will not stay. The sun finds us like fear or family, fills the stomach and asks to borrow you a while. Like sugar forgets to bring you back. My skin and orange peeling. There aren't enough words, only these halting, half erased in stone. My wife is resting with Jesus, but just how long the widower sat here, staring at the hole no dirt can fill, the wound in the ground above his 20-year-old bride, whose stone now tilts and wilts like a bouquet, I cannot say. This is called Skeleton Key. Conductor of the quiet, keeper of the lost, Singer of all the songs longing I have forgot. Lead me from this yard of bones, these houses of stone, to the wooden home where my mother got herself born. Later turned down, sorry, later torn down and turned to fire. I remember well the ground that shone four feet below through its raised holy floor. Lead me over the Red River, past plantations my uncle's picked cotton in, and sometimes my mother. Shepherd me past fields filled with storm and still short corn. Let me be reborn among the overgrowth and the shotgun houses giving up into the green, quiet conductor. How, like the termite, I want to enter the house. The way Mama Annie will latch her screen door shut whenever anyone steps out into the heat just for a moment. Great burglar, lover of the lost, lend me your skeleton key to this house and the one after. And I want to thank you again for coming out. I'm going to end with uh, a poem that's last in this new book. It's called Trumpet. Thanks again. <coughs> Trumpet. Sink your elbows into the red earth. Root down among these mounds the dead live beneath, generations of grass above the yawning ground. Let cicadas fill my mouth. Let the crows make of my ears a nest filled with every shining thing they can find, the names only known by the fading foil labels of funeral homes. Knead this soil, it's brackish bread. My skin butter the sun browns but does not burn. I bend to the mud with the few trees I lean. Shepherd my tongue with the smallest sounds. With the ants, let's descend. Let's fall and file our rows irregular as verbs, as these graves that grow without rain. Let forever the flowers bloom. Not like the plastic perennials, but these daylilies that repeat out of the dirt their mouths orange and asking, offering themselves up every year. Sunlights, trumpets, they sound their low bugle and beauty while the sun's flag sinks and sings. Let the dogs stay asleep, silent beneath my grandmother's house, wearing black like their mother whose paw some stranger's car ran over, now curled, broken, and unhealed, like kin. She leads them, her children, through a world that offers up only these hours, scrawny and red as the runt she still loves. The curs call this home, crawl under gutted cars as if 
the soil to keep cool. Let them eat the heat, licking their faces with wind that calls and will not forget to wants to erase all the names we hope to claim. Let this life climb its ivy over me. Let it drag down the rust of the roof of the sharecropper house, the wood wormed and turned to paper, the paper turning again to leaf, the words, let my hands be sunk deep into this dirt that breathes and breeds these graves, tombs like tree stumps as far as you can see, as near. What we fear, we find. Everything but time. Gravestones, teeth crooked and golden in the gaping mouth of the ground. These stones hope to escape the earth, wriggling free like children, impatient, their ruddy tongues stuck out. These stones that taunt but won't call out our names, at least quite yet. My song, my winding sheet, my bones, my only home. Sun, when the time comes, cover me in red. Rust shall be my final bed. Will long outlast my henna hands. Thank you. Questions? <laughs> Good, I'll just. Uh... There's one way over here. Oh, that. Yeah. Please use the mic just because of recording. First of all, first of all, thank you so much. Um, this is more of a uh, a craft formal question. Okay. Just in terms I thought you were going to say it's more of a comment. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the dangerous. Just in terms of um, like uh, line breaks, since it's yeah. such an intimate aspect of a poem for any poet, where you decide to break the lines, how you approach, yeah. how it exists on a page, is there um, any just kind of Anything you can give about how you approach that when writing yeah. your own poems, or how it's changed for you over time, anything like that? Sure. I mean, I I, I think it changes. Um, I try when I'm teaching to tell my students to you know find their line. You know, the line kind of can lead you a lot of places. And sometimes, as a poet, you're trying to find that breath. You know, because uh, one of the things I think is the poem is a unit of breath. It's a unit of sense. Sometimes, for me though, it's really a unit of music. Um, and trying to capture that inner music is really the point of the line. And so, um, you know, a lot of it comes from speech, but, um, you know, I, I remember learning a lot from a poet uh, like Denise Levertov, who I study with. And um, some of you who might have been in my class have heard me say, like, she was really influential in me because if you're reading uh, your own poem and you didn't read the line break, she'd be like, what are you doing? You know, she'd stop you cold. And um, you know, she was like, the page is a score, she'd say over and over again. And she was really uh, stressed that, especially in free verse, that's how the reader, as the conductor, knows the music of the poem, right? And so that was really important to me. And then another thing that I realized later that I came to is, oh, my score is, is different. My score is my own. Um, it thinks about jazz and blues and these musics that um, I think, uh, for me, surround poems and made poems possible. So um, at the same time, and I think you can hear in some of those new poems, I was trying to, I feel like it's a slightly different line. It looks different on the page, um, in part because it was a different feeling. It was a different moment. You know? So you have to evolve even within your line. And um, you know, I don't think I could capture my mother's talk or my grandmother's talk or or my cousin's loss if, if I hadn't thought about uh, the way that that loss was expressed. 
because some of it is in those pauses and, and caesura that are part of language, right? But that when we sit down to, to write poems, sometimes we're like, well, I'm putting on my poet's hat and you know, out comes the iambic <coughs> pentameter. Um, nothing wrong with that, of course. Um, you know, some would say that's a heartbeat, you know, but um, not all of us have regular heartbeats. So you have, to, you have to think about what's the living thing, you know, how does it speed up, how does it slow down? Um, and to me, a, a good line of poetry uh, surprises you and, and also contains the rest of the poem. Um, so it's a lot of pressure on a little few syllables, right? But to me, that is some of what happens. And at a certain point, of course, if you're writing a while, it's just instinctual, you hope. Way in the back there. Or inside. Hi. Hi. Thank you so much for being here. I'm a huge fan. My name is Cindy Guerra. And I actually have a question about youth experience. And um, in one of your poems, you, I would like to, to know. If, if you wouldn't mind, uh, if you can stand, would you mind standing? Thank you. Um, I would like to know what you think about or how it was to to get to to the intense period of reflection mm. when you talk when you are currently the age that you are mm -hmm. and you're reflecting upon individual experience that are compromised my use your notes so yeah sure I, I'm with you that derive from social political groups um, yeah. that you identify with. And I know that, that like the black um, the black power movements that you mentioned throughout your poems yeah. and also when you talk about things like we were black back then yeah. or African American very yeah. powerful. So I'm wondering how sure. you navigate that space. Thank you. It's a great question. I mean, I, I, again, I, I, I think um, I navigated it in the poem you refer to, the De La Soul is Dead, through music. Um, it felt like that was very immediate for me, and all these songs, all these playlists, all these cassettes I still have, you know, um, were ways of accessing that. And I really wanted to sort of capture the mix of the moment, you know. Um, and so many of those songs we like, you know, listen to on repeat, which wasn't as easy as it is now. You know, you had to rewind it or, or like the CD, maybe you had the setting and you were just hoping that portable CD player didn't skip or whatever. Um, so there was a kind of uh, nostalgia built into just thinking about those songs. But so much of that was this particular moment, like that kid Kenny I mentioned who I looked like. And I, we really did look alike. Um, we even had the same like little glasses. And um, a funny side note to that story is uh, I was going to go see some jazz with a friend of mine in, in the city. And we're waiting outside, and a guy comes out from the, former, uh, the first set. We were seeing the second set, and it was Kenny. And I was like, there's Kenny, It'll, Kenny. Uh, so, but because we're old, we didn't take a selfie or anything. Um, <laughs> but it was good to see him. Uh, and I literally hadn't seen him since you know, the activities in that poem. But at the same time, it felt like there was something we were dancing through or around. Um, that had to do with this, in the case of hip hop, like new music that was being made and it felt like it was being made for us. Of course it was being made out of old music. And so that kind of, hip hop, hip -hop has its own nostalgia built into it. It has its own, you know, it's referring to um, revolutionary songs sometimes, uh, but that's its fabric, you know, and then you're like dancing over that. And so that kind of combination felt right to describe that nostalgia. Um, I think the important thing is to uh, write through that moment and try to see both our moment and that moment clear. And many times when you're writing about the past, you're really writing about now. Uh, when I was writing these poems about, you know, uh, being young in Kansas and the strange, you know, microaggressions or racism one faced, I was also thinking about, you know, uh, walking around now. Um, when I was writing about my son, uh, in his childhood, I also was thinking about mine in a weird way, and like just by juxtaposing those things, um, there was some suggestion of uh, continuity in good ways and continuity in bad ones. Um, so I really think that, to me, that's sort of the water 
you're trying to create or like to nest your flowers in or something. That's a terrible mixed metaphor. But um, the, the truth is you're trying to create this context, right? And some of that context for me is this music, are those leaders, you know, and some of them appear in here from Ali, who of course transcends sports, to uh, Hank Aaron. Um, you know, these are all people, you know, his hate mail is here and it makes its appearance in the poem. Um, you know, I was trying to think about, excuse me, the ways that unlikely places have deep meaning. Um, and at the same time, I also wanted to write about Emmett Till and his losses. And writing about him, I couldn't help but think about my son or think about you know, Trayvon Martin, who also was in the book. So all these figures are there to talk to each other and continue this conversation. Yes, in the front row. We have a few back there. Good to see you. Yes, I'm doing some research here on Marcus Garvey. And one of the things at the Rose Library, and one of the things I, I uh, became familiar with even before I started to research at the Rose Library was the poetry of Marcus Garvey. Yeah, fascinating. Yes, and so what you put that, he did most of his poetry in prison. One of them was Keep Cool. You know, so he wouldn't riot. Yeah. Those things that are associated sure, with uh, sure, sure. disturbances. So how would you uh, attempt to put that in context? Because he will, he's not known for his poetry. Right. I, I know some people have written books about his poetry. Sure, yeah. Not known for his poetry. So how would you uh, place that in context? Because he was a person that, from Jamaica, like Sure, sure, sure. Uh, and so people really may not be familiar with him. Yeah. It sounds like you're... Uh, <laughs> in the midst of uh, making that case for that poetry, I think would be really interesting. I actually confess I don't know it very well. I know he wrote poetry. Um, it was always part of his UNIA publications. And, and, and you know, um, for instance, at Schomburg, we recently got the papers of Fab Five Freddy, the great hip hop impresario and, and pioneer. And he made the, you know, one of the first uh, French language, uh, hip hop records, all these things. But his grandfather uh, was a Garveyite and wrote poems for that paper. And, and so to me, that, you know, uh, that hasn't yet been sort of excavated fully, uh, that moment. And I confess, I uh, you know, don't know if I have the lift to do it. There's so many poets at the time, Langston Hughes. Uh, uh, but like, you know, we have Zora Neale Hurston's poems at, uh, at um, Schomburg. So I think there's a long tale of poetry that tells a story, and the more voices, the better. I, I'm doing this large anthology of all of African American poetry, um, which is nearly impossible, but it, it's a thousand pages, you know what I mean? Because our poetry is so rich. Um, I'm not sure uh, where to place Garvey in that, but hopefully that's the kind of context that I think Garvey deserves and needs to understand the import of, you know, what I would call kind of verse culture, which has gone away a bit. Um, we don't, we're not used to, you know, politics in verse, sadly, or, or maybe that's changed, you know. Uh, as an editor, I see people struggling to write political poems, uh, but black folks have always been doing so. And so there's an interesting moment where now it seems weird if you're a poet and you are like, there are no politics, you know? They're totally <laughs> irrelevant, to, you know, like that's real strange. And so in a weird way, I think poets who came up like in slam and all, I'm going far from your question, but um, it's relevant to me because people who are writing in these traditions that maybe seem polemical now seem prescient. It's a little like Baldwin. We read him and we realize, man, he was, he had his finger on this pulse, pulse right? Um, and you know, you can come up and see his poems, too. Uh, not as good as, um, you know, Hurston's, maybe. Um, but, you know, I, I love that people turn to poetry to express something they can't always find somewhere else. Thank you. It's a great question. Thank you. A couple more before we... Yes? I have a yes or no question. Oh, no. <laughs> you know I'm a poet, right? We, we'll, we go with maybe or... I, I really liked Oblivion. Oh. I mean, that's just not fair. <laughs> How can I refuse a request? Uh, maybe I'll read it at the end when we get the last question. Yeah. Okay, the back there. Let's just do a couple more, maybe. 
Hi. Um, hey. This is a difficult question to ask. Um, I'm not implying it about you. So let's just say this is a hypothetical poet. Oh, no. <laughs> um, and you know, as they're working on a poem, there's some beautiful sounding combinations of words, and um, they get too drawn into it. OK. So like, how do you avoid, because you didn't do that at all. I mean, how do you avoid like having something that's too much for effect in terms of the sounds? Mm. You know, that how do you achieve that balance where it's like not like a stretch that there's beautiful alliterations or assonances or other yeah. sonic things? Because um, you did avoid that. <laughs> so, uh, wow. It's a tough, I know it's a tough it, question. I mean, I, I think there's no one answer to this hypothetical. Because you know all the poets that come to mind who aren't hypothetical, who play with language, which are all poets, um, they love language at some level, and sometimes they get carried away. Thank goodness, you know. And part of that, I think, is we sometimes, um, you know, someone like uh, Gertrude Stein, or you know, what does history teach? It teaches. What <laughs> does history teach? History teaches. You know. Um, I think that there's these kind of swirls, or, or Bob Kaufman, who sometimes is a sound poet, simply. He has a poem called Oregon that says Oregon about 50 times, you know. And by the end, Oregon is, ev you know, it's everything. It's heaven, it's, it's earth, it's, it's paradise, it's the place he's headed. Um, it's also the word Negro tumbled around. And so, you know, I, it's hard for me to say, you know, that sonic thing, thank goodness he went very far in it. Um, and I, I think that that kind of quality, if, if I had a student come to me and say, I'm really worried about my sounds overcoming sense, I'd be like, please do it. You know? Please like, have your sounds be ahead of your sense. And the sense to me comes from getting the sounds right. Um, and people who are like, you know, my poem, it, you know, like the logic of a poem is it, it's tricky. You know, when I'm reading for the New Yorker and you know, we get 40,000 poems a year, uh, I actually can never tell if it's submissions or poems. I think it's just submissions. So. Um, and you know, I don't read all 40,000, but someone does. Uh, my assistant and, and another person, just two people. Uh, but I read many thousand. And um, I think the thing that catches my attention or that I remember is a sound, is a startling, surprising thing. You know, it isn't, you know, boy, that poem made a lot of sense. That's not. <laughs> uh, uh, so it's really often like, wow, I was blown away by that made me think because it's stuck in my craw. It's like music. It has to move you. Uh, and William Carlos Williams said, if it ain't a pleasure, it ain't a poem. And um, I think there's many kinds of pleasure. And the sonic quality is, is high in there. Thank you. How about two? Yeah, just two more. I know this interlocutor. So. Hey, Kevin. Hey, what's up? Great to have you back. And, Thanks. Um, wonderful to hear some of the some of the oldies, but goodies, and the <laughs> new ones. And um, but there's a line in two poems from the previous volume that that kind of goes off like a detonating device, and that is nobody was dead yet. Yeah. And there's so much that's unsaid in the line. Sure. And um, I wonder if you could just talk about that as a line. And like yeah. What, how did you get to it? Um, and what it sort of, what, what, yeah. What and happened? What, 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 not, 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 not the incidents, but sure. that your development as a poet to get to that line. Yeah, yeah. That's a great question. I mentioned yesterday, I talked some to the creative writing students, which was really great fun. Um, and I mentioned a little bit about, um, you know, uh, sort of a process of the sonnet that I wrote, and that was the sonnet. You know, and it started out being a poem about that weird cusp of a moment when, you know, maybe a couple people said African American, but we were still black, you know, and what that meant to us. Um, and that end, you know, and I just loved all the things we used to say instead of goodbye, you know. Uh, we'd say anything but goodbye. Um, and so, and I remember it happened almost because I, I was talking to a white friend and I said, bet. And he was like, what are you talking about, bet? <laughs> I'm like, oh, I mean, like, yes, sure. Uh, I don't know. I had to, like, translate back and then back in. You know, it was real hard to, um, like, you know, explain goodbye to someone in another language, right? Um, 
and that we both shared. So in a weird way, it was like a, reclaiming this language. And then at the same time, you know, the feeling that I think happens in the poem, which is I, I think happens in a few of the sonnets, like there's a turn, you know, and that's obviously classic in a sonnet. And it just really happens at the end there. No one was dead yet. Um, because I couldn't just talk about that cusp without thinking of this other cusp, the cusp of adulthood and, you know, the, the next poem, which is the poem about breaking into the pool, which is the same pool that at the end, uh, Seamus Heaney and I climbed down into when it was drained. Um, and I sat by him to watch my friend do a, his play, which I think back, is like, what a generous dude to go to the <laughs> undergraduate play by, you know, someone doing your uh, translation, you know, it was amazing. Um, but so I wanted to try to capture that feeling. And, you know, what was weird about <clears throat> working on the sequence, because it started off just as that poem, and then became this sequence. And I knew somewhere along the line, I don't think at the beginning, that would end with the same ending. Nobody, nobody was dead. And, um, you know, as I was writing it, I wrote the Prince poems, then Prince died. I wrote poems about, um, a uh, tribe called Quest, and then Fife Dog died. I'm like, what is happening? I better stop <laughs> writing these poems. But it was also you know, true of uh, people I knew, you know, people who were in those poems. Some of them died before, some of them died after. And I was really trying to capture what that loss meant. Uh, to put it a different way, uh, hip hop is so much about loss. You know? It's so much about recycling, and it thinks about loss. It thinks about what was before. It, it's constantly churning itself, you know, when it was, uh, when it's at its best. Um, and I, I think that when it's at its worst, it's still pretty fun. <coughs> um, but I was really trying to capture that feeling, which was nostalgia mixed with hope, mixed with kind of a double nostalgia. And <coughs> in that process, the sounds are what led me. The sounds are what coursed the poem along and turned it from you know, a, a memoir or something to what I hope is a, a sequence that echoes a little bit. Yeah, we have a last question over here. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. <coughs> hey, sister. My name is Ananda Lowe, and thank you so much for sharing. Thanks for having um, me. Yes, I had a two part question. Okay. Circle back. It circles back. Okay. So, I wanted to talk about your exploration of black culture. Yeah. So, I wanted to, um, one, talk about your exploration of black culture through these um, kind of set poetry models, like you were talking about navigating the black language. So how are you navigating, how has your experience been navigating and exploring black language, black experience through the English language? How has okay. it been? And how has your experience at the Schomburg and this kind of mecca of black culture um, expanded your poetry? Has it had yeah. the impact been, especially in a linguistic fashion? Well, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, and it was very quick. To, that was like the shortest two-part question <laughs> anyone has ever asked in an after interview. Um, you know, I, I think that there's many, many answers because it's kind of a big question, too, which I like about it. But um, for me, I really realized at some point that we were in the midst of a renaissance and that Schomburg had been there for the first of many, I think, but during the Harlem Renaissance. 1925 is when it was founded. Uh, we'll be 95 in a, a month. And um, looking back over that to see the ways that the Schomburg was so important to research and so many people worked there. I mean, Langston Hughes was a big fan. His ashes are now in the Schomburg under the floor um, in this beautiful, on this beautiful artwork uh, in his name. And you know, to have sort of that energy there, that sp presiding spirit, I think makes you think a lot about these kinds of questions and these kind of continuities. Um, and being in Harlem, which I think is a special thing, you hear language on the street every day, you know, and you can't help but be changed by that. But you also hear music. You hear at the Schomburg all these things, thinking about uh, where we're at now, but also looking back. And I think that's what a good poem does. Um, I think that's sometimes what language does. Um, and for me, that kind of linguistic excitement is really interesting right now because you have all these great poets uh, you know, some of them, like Natasha was here, you know, writing these great poems. There's been so many uh, Pulitzers in the past 
<coughs> excuse me, like seven years or something um, that weren't there before. And so I think in a weird way, people are riding at the top of their form, but also people are finally being recognized for doing it because, you know, Langston Hughes won no Pulitzers. Uh, Baldwin won nothing, you know, but we're, they're the poets we lift up, the figures we think about. Um, I will end by just by telling you I, I was recently at <coughs> uh, and asked to talk at, which was really powerful, Toni Morrison's memorial service. Um, and there were about, I don't know, 2,000 people there. And I kept thinking, A, we're all here because she wrote those books. You know, and she edited those books, and she made this world of language, you know. And some people talked about her language. <clears throat> Everyone evoked it. And it was just really powerful to hear and realize, you know, and also, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I have a frog in my throat. Um, also realize that everyone on the stage were pretty much writers. Uh, Edwige, Danticat, and uh, Tanahesi, and, you know, a real array of poets, Oprah, um, <laughs> and um, what was incredible is to see how different everyone was, you know. We've all been writing a little while, and to see how everyone had their own way of talking about this gift that was uh, Toni Morrison. Um, and so I, I hope I'm trying to answer your question in terms of language, you know, because you have to kind of, you know, we share a language, as you hinted, thinking about English, writing uh, black while Engl in English. At the same time, we all have to find our own language. And that kind of rich combination is really empowering to me. And it is, in many ways, what you find in archives. You find the drafts and the ways that people are getting at that language. Um, and you know, Toni Morrison <coughs> was so powerful. Because as an editor, she edited someone like Lucille Clifton, whose uh, papers I helped get here. Um, and I think I was always struck by going through them how rich they were in language. And to see those documents where Toni Morrison and Lucille Clifton are talking in the margins of her manuscript. I mean, that's what brings me to life. And that's the language that matters to me, that intimate language between two people writing and, and talking. And, that's another way of describing a poem to me. So thanks so much for your questions. For having me. So I have the honor of wrapping up this evening. I'm Jennifer King, the director of the Rose Library. And I want to start by thanking Kevin for sharing your inner music with us tonight, and also for bringing the Rose Library to life with your words and with this community. And I want to thank everyone who came tonight and ask that you please keep in touch with the Rose Library and join us for events that we have throughout the year. And also to um, stick around after this event and purchase a book and have it signed and have a conversation with Kevin. So thank you everybody and have a great night.